Okay, and welcome to this week's recording from a previous class that Dr. Clavo Hall provided. Uh, this class was actually recorded, I believe it was two years ago when this course was taught. And it's a little bit longer than some of the other ones that we've used. You'll note that uh, slides two and three in particular, it spends a fair amount of time on some background things and trying to relate things both to your overall dissertation project as well as things that have come up at earlier points in the class, so trying to make some of those larger connections. I probably could have been a little more judicious in how I split up the content. However, as I reviewed it a couple of times, I thought it was important to include all of that additional banter that is in there. And you'll note that while there are a fair amount of what Dr. Clavo Hall is saying you can tell is in response to either things that the students in the class had said based on her questions of them or the interjections that the students made on their own accord and as with previous recordings I haven't included those student um, voices in there because I don't have permission to include them as a part of the recording that's been provided. I have Dr. Clavel Hall's permission to use her materials but I think her side of the banter I believe is quite useful in understanding how this topic of uh, translational methods and the idea of systems thinking plays into a larger conversation about translational research and evidence-based practice. The other thing that's a little bit different, and this is also one of the reasons why it's a little bit longer than some of the other lectures that you've um, viewed for this class. In this case, this one is about 40 minutes of material from Dr. Clavel Hall, plus this brief introduction and a brief conclusion at the end from myself, is that unlike the other ones where it's been clear where uh, Dr. Clavel Hall has discussed the content from the White et al. textbook and the material from the Bronson et al. textbook was discussed in a more discreet way so it was easy for me to divide essentially a larger lecture up into two smaller pieces in some of these past recordings. This particular one you'll note it's much more integrated in how it looks and I think that's because what you're starting to see in the chapters now is a much more integrated approach in terms of the types of things that they're talking about when it comes to translational research. You should see a great deal of overlap between the kind of systems thinking that uh, Bronson et al. are talking about in their particular chapter, and in particular the issue of project management that White et al. talks about in chapter 9. So you should be able to see, I guess, a, a convergence, if you will, of the content between these two texts, which is why the uh, lecture for this particular week is much more cohesive in terms of discussing the two textbooks as opposed to being able to talk about White et al. in isolation compared to talking about Bronson et al. in isolation. So I'll end the brief introduction there and uh, tell you to settle in for about 40 minutes of uh, recorded uh, content from Dr. Clavel Hall. Okay, so again, we're going to be uh, doing some work with uh, looking more at translations and looking a bit about uh, looking at some of the different methods of translating. And as we look at that, it still goes back to what is the main purpose of this whole translation situation? Why are we looking at it? Why are we bothering with trying to learn methods of translation? Okay, and that's what I'm getting at. We're doing all this, trying to learn these methodologies, having these conversations, picking up these tools to help impact and improve clinical outcomes for our patients as nurses. That's what's driving all of this, okay? And 
it's interesting. I guess I'll tell you this. I'm about 3,000 miles away from you guys. And um, I was on a plane today and sitting next to a gentleman. And we were both reading. And so uh, I was reading some of our work that we're looking at tonight. And he asked me what I was reading. And I said, oh, you know, looking at evidence-based practice. And he's like, what's that about? I said, trying to improve clinical outcomes for patients by using evidence. He gives me, he shows me a book and uh, I think it was called The Unquieted Mind. And uh, I believe it's a, it was a book about a bipolar, he lived a bipolar life, but became a part of a, uh, several research studies to help treat her bipolar, um, her bipolar disease. And uh, he was saying, I'm amazed it was uh, found to be more genetic than anything else, according to this research. He said, I'm reading this book because my daughter is bipolar. And the more I read this book, the more I look back on my daughter's life and see how uh, she's actually shown some of these symptoms. And he says the, his daughter's mother's side is uh, mentally unstable, but you know, that's only one side of the story. And so uh, the, the point being that I told him, even in this illness that he's reading about and that he's living with, with his daughter, as nurses, we are trying to find the evidence that teaches us what is the best way of helping to treat somebody with such a long-term and life debilitating disease at times. We are trying to treat her with evidence to make her better. So he says, well, you know, uh, what happens is they'll find a treatment like lithium, they'll take it, take it, take it, then they stop and then they get worse again and it's just up and down. And I said, as nurses using evidence-based practice, we would understand that that's a part of the illness to have that cyclical up and down, uh, what is it, uh, way of behavior. So nurses taking care of a patient like your daughter would not look at her as a failure, a flake, or somebody not worthy of investing our time in taking care of. We would understand that research it tells us this is a part of how this disease works and be able to help your daughter to realize what she's going through is not unusual for that disease and be able to better encourage her to be compliant with her treatment or to look at her holistically and try to understand what's going on in the... So mm -hmm. what I thought was interesting about this conversation is that here was a problem I was not even thinking about, uh, had no knowledge of, but to see how evidence-based practice and translational uh, research and translational work tie into healthcare. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, problems come in many titles, many types, many populations, but there are some things about translating research and translating evidence into practice that are basic that you can pick up from wherever it is to help improve the outcomes of a clinical uh, disorder. And it was just an interesting real life example of what we're coming here every week trying to talk about and see where's Kyle. How does all this relate to, to where we're going here? I, think I didn't read the book. I did take a snapshot of it because I wanted to go and look, and look at the evidence and possibly check some of the credibility of the yes. evidence. Here we have it. So as we move forward for tonight, we're going to look at uh, pro project management and start to trying to discuss some of the roles of education in project management and go back a little to last week and some from this week of looking at a little bit of systems thinking in uh, dissemination and, uh, and implementation. So we start with project management. Uh, the first thing I want to ask is, how many of you have worked on projects in your clinical area? So, and uh, healthcare environments are known for doing projects and uh, 
being able to think greater better. So we look at uh, project management, looking at the definition here, the process employed by uh, many disciplines engaged in high stakes complex work. And what we need to know is this is not just about healthcare. What are some, some other fields we've talked about that might do project management uh, processes in their field? Any other field? And here, it's, uh, you can even get, if you took out the high, well, you could say I'm thinking things as straightforward as construction. And, and in the beginning, you might think, what's the big deal? You know, it, it's constructing a building. I don't know if, um, I don't know if many of you have heard, I believe it was last year in the Berkeley area where some students, unfortunately, what happened was it was a, a like an apartment building and several of the students from Berkeley and some of these were international students. They were at a party, but they were out on the balcony of the apartment and it collapsed and many of these young people lost their lives. And when we talk about uh, project management, this definition says engaged in high stakes work. Remember, sometimes things are not, you don't see how high stakes they are until they don't work. And that was the, the balcony. And people don't think of, oh, building and people were out on the balcony. That's normal. That's what balconies are made for. But if it's not done properly, look at what can happen. And like I said, these people, young people lost their lives. Uh, and we look at uh, we look at healthcare and uh, say yes, it's high stake. We look at nuclear uh, at nuclear industries, uh, businesses that are making nuclear missiles. That's high stakes. But also something as apparently simple as baking. You bake and you send it to your child's school. If what you bake make children sick, that can become high stakes as well. So project management has a place in many different industries. It's according to what the purpose is and what you're trying to do. And as we look at the purpose here, they talk about project management is trying to achieve outcomes. And that's how we started tonight's conversation. We're trying to improve clinical outcomes. Project management Trying to have fidelity to home. What does that mean to you? That break fidelity to plan as it relates to project management. So we've read about fidelity before. What does this mean? Project management, fidelity to plan. So when we talk about fidelity to plan in your readings, we've talked about fidelity. Fidelity meaning when you adopt an intervention, are you adopting it at the same level that it was created by the originating, the original uh, creators of the intervention? Okay. Uh, hand washing intervention. Uh, say Suzanne worked up an intervention where she said, uh, ICU nurses need to wash their hands each time before they go into every patient's room. So then Jenny comes along and she's going to adopt Suzanne's uh, protocol for hand washing. But Jenny decides, I think that Suzanne probably meant people need to wash their hands before they go into each person's room uh, the first time that they go into the room rather than each time. That's fidelity of plan. Did Suzanne mean in her original inter in intervention or innovation that hand washing needs to be done upon entering each patient's room every time they enter? She wrote that up in her protocol, but when Jenny came along, she decided to uh, change it a bit. And when she changed it a bit, 
that's where we're talking about fidelity to plan. Did you adopt it the exact same way as the originator of the innovation? That's what project management helps you do. Adhere to the original plan as much as possible. And if you don't, because every project is not going to be applied to every setting or every population exactly the same, but what you get with project management is you determine that you're going to explain why you didn't follow it to the letter. Okay, that's fidelity to plan. And why, any questions about that? And what about this completion on time and within budget? Why is that important purpose for project management? Time is money. However, both of those, uh, neither of those is constant. Both usually, they're both decreasing. If money doesn't usually increase and time is passing. So you have to watch both of them and then it moves to what you said, Lindsay, about feasibility. It could get to a point that what you uh, thought you would be doing in February of uh, 2019 has become less feasible by the time you actually want to do it. Budget priorities change, management priorities change, uh, different things change, so you have to keep watching all of that, all of those moving parts, and that's what project management will help you do. Anybody else want to say something about that before we go on? One of the uh, other things when we go here for uses, it says it's optimal for knowledge translation and innovations when you're evidence-based practice with frameworks, theories, and models. And I know that we've looked at uh, frameworks, I believe that was in uh, earlier chapters. We looked at frameworks in chapter two. We looked at uh, models in chapter eight, and now we're on uh, project management here in chapter nine. So in looking at these things, I want to say one of the big things that we have to look at tonight is this work about project management applies to your DNP project. This is one of the most tangible uh, concepts that's going to go with you throughout your term in this program because this is what you have to produce for your chosen project. What I was saying is what we're doing here with project management is one of the most tangible things that we've covered in this class so far that you will be using for your DNP project. This is how you're going to be building your DNP project as you move forward through the end of this program. Does everyone have their uh, White and Dudley into her book, Translation of Evidence in Nursing and Healthcare? If you do, I need you to please turn to page 184 and 185. And once you get there, I'm going to ask someone, if you have it, would you read on page 184, I'm looking at the bottom paragraph, the last paragraph, where it starts with DNP students in traditional research, so that's what PhD students do, okay? And I'm going to ask Tiffany, do you see that next paragraph that starts with doctoral students? Would you read that for us, please? Thank you both. So the reason we're looking at this is you and your DMP project is different than, than a PhD project in PhD students are doing research to develop new knowledge in a field. They are doing research. That is more of the bench type, new knowledge. The difference is the doctor of nursing practitioner or the doctor of nursing practice is actually taking already developed knowledge, 
already developed evidence and translating it into practice. So you're taking something that a PhD student or a bench laboratory uh, scientist may have developed and you're translating it into practice. The PhD students, they have a well-worn path of how this process works. And as a PhD student, I know they beat it into your head to do it the way the instructors did it when they were doing it, uh, getting their PhD. However, the doctor of nursing practice is a newer profession and it doesn't have this uh, rigorous and already established way of doing your DNP projects. And that is why project management and the steps of project management are going to serve you as a standard way to move forward with your DNP project and how you're going to be writing that project up. Okay. So two things, your work is not to bring new knowledge, but it's to translate some already known knowledge or evidence into practice. So I wanted to point out to you the difference between what you're doing and what, uh, what PhD researchers do, because sometimes students in, uh, their pro in our program will begin to do a project and it ends up being new knowledge and trying to explain to you why it's not DMP work, it's not evidence-based practice project. In this same book, go to the front of the book and find table P1 in the very same book. And I think it's on uh, Roman numeral page 16 in the preface. And there'll be a table at the top of the page. Do you see that? With, and what that shows you is it lays out the difference between research, which is what the PhD student does, and evidence-based practice, which is what the, you as a DMP student will be doing. And QI can be a part of your evidence-based practice pro project, um, but it's more extensive than QI. And then the master's level students in our program are doing QI improvement projects. But you'll have an evidence-based practice project where somebody will say, I'm going to use the Six Sigma framework for my project. Uh, that's a type of QI uh, framework, but it works quite well in your EBP project. Somebody might say, I'm going to use PDSA in my evidence project. So it's okay to use quality improvement uh, types of tools in your evidence-based practice uh, to do so. Any questions on that? So just stop me if you need to. So now we look at where we've gone so far. As we said, we've talked about frameworks in some of our previous classes uh, for your DNP project, your paper. You will want to have a type of framework, either a conceptual model or a framework or a theory to frame your project around. And that was what we spent time talking about when we covered frameworks over in chapter two. So your paper, your project needs to be built on a theory or a framework or a model because we said that is your, uh, what is it? That would be your framing of it uh, as to how, uh, how you're going to discuss and explain your project. Okay, so just remember your project, you want a framework or a theory, a conceptual model, something that you can share with the team so they can mm -hmm. follow along with your thought process of how you're trying to build. Now, what do you think, these, these three legs are what help us to um, build the, the project planning for transition. What do you think the methods part is about? The method is the steps that you took to actually implement the change or the project. The steps that you took to uh, accomplish your project, okay? As she said, 
whether it's quantitative, qualitative, what kind of tools did you use? Did you use a survey? Did you use a questionnaire? Did you have focus groups? Did you do interviews? You're describing to the person who doesn't understand the meat of your project for them to read through the methods and say, oh, okay, I got it. I can follow what he or she is doing in this process. We're going, so that is how we're getting started with the project planning is to start with the frameworks or theories and have the method that you're going to approach to do it. And the next thing you will have is looking at this particular uh, diagram. What's going on here is we're talking about how you're going to build your project. And as we said, this is your DNP project. This is the thing that's going to help you or get you graduated out of this project, out of this program. This is uh, why you're here to try and learn how to build a project and get the skills to do so. So you have what we started with are the frameworks, the methods, and we're doing the project plan. And all of that is to get to the goal of accomplishing the quadruple aim. We do this, as we said, to improve clinical outcomes. And according to IHI, the uh, outcomes would be impacting the patient experience. The outcomes could be improving uh, population health, the outcome reducing costs, the outcome looking at care team well-being. So when you think about what types of projects you want to look at for your DNP project, these are good place, good general places to start with. Or if you have a setting or population that you're wanting to do your project in, I would encourage you to think back about the quadruple aim and see where does your project fit within the quadruple aim? Which of these four things my evidence-based practice project will impact, okay? And it may impact more than one of the four at one time, and that's fine. So that helps give you an idea of, are you on the right track or a good track with trying to improve outcomes? Because that's what the quadruple aim is about. We talked about leadership last time. Is transformational leaders are trying to create other leaders. They're trying to inspire other people to be leaders. They're trying to help the team to work together to build the empowerment of the entire team. And that's what gets things like this pit crew in the winning car by all of these people working together under a time crunch in a high stakes position because somebody could die from this the results of their work together as a team. Unfortunate things happen in these particular type races. So uh, transformational leadership would be the best type of leadership that would underline this particular activity. So basically working alone, uh, you're not going to get as much done. You're not gonna get the buy-in you would from working with the team as the pit crew would. You're probably not going to have as much resources because one man, no matter how wonderful, can't do it all alone, okay? So the bottom line is actually trying to work in a team and with transformational leadership in healthcare has been working best according to the, uh, according to the evidence thus far. So now, we talk about the phases of uh, project management. And the big thing I'd like to say about this is when you're doing your project, your DMP project, you're going to be walking through each of these phases between now and the time you graduate. And at a deep dive that you may even get very tired of some days and very tired of the people advising you through it, but this is going to be a big part of your life. But in chapter nine, they said they're going to focus on just two of these phases, which two are, are groups, process groups, 
are we going to get into with the work from chapter nine? So yes, and I want to remind people, you've got to keep up, try and keep up with your reading because there's a lot of information coming through here. Uh, you're correct, it is uh, the initiation phase and the planning phase that they're dealing with uh, today in our readings. And I'm going to refer you to, we're still in the white book, uh, white into her. If you go to uh, page 186, please. And as you go to page 186, I'm actually uh, looking at what it says at the bottom, phase one, and you can read in the translation project. When you look there, uh, the first subtopic that you see is the problem statement. And uh, that is one of the first things that you're going to be writing in your DNP project paper is a problem statement. Let's go down to the final paragraph on page 187 because you're bringing up a very important point where it says the PICO format. You see that paragraph at the bottom? And many of us often, uh, and I have to say, I've even felt for a long time that every problem started with the PICO. But it, as we read on page 187, the PICO format that standardizes the statement of the problem in context requires the statement of the problem, the proposal, intervention, comparison, uh, look down at the second to the last sentence on that page for translation projects. What does it say? Because it's not used. And that is surprising because that's where a lot of, for sure, the QI projects start. Uh, and I think, as they said here, uh, the sentence before is this convention is counterproductive in translation because it requires forecasting of the intervention before the prosecution of the evidence. Do you understand that sentence? And it says it here in that bottom paragraph, the outcome is the desired outcome. That's what the O is in PICO on page 187. And in evidence-based practice, as Lindsay's explaining, in this population and is in this setting you don't know what the outcome is going to be so they want you to just explain the problem statement and the background of of the problem and not go into uh hypothesizing what the outcome is going to be and so for tiffany and those of us who would love to start on pico because it's a nice tangible thing to hold on to with translation, according to our authors here, the white duck brown into her, we're not going to use PICO uh, to start with in our translation projects. But we will use a pro problem statement. And what I like is there's an example of a problem statement here in that indented quotation where it says, healthcare workers across multiple settings. That's an example of how you might start out your problem statement. So I'm, I'm emphasizing this because this is a part of your paper, an important part of your paper. It's the first thing people are going to read about your project. And you, you've got to be able to articulate it as uh, concisely uh, as possible to have people understand what your problem and your project is about. So that's on page 186 and 187. Okay, uh, somebody else has their 188. You see, uh, it says, a search is conducted, evidence is gathered, reviewed, critiqued, and summarized. What are they talking about there? They're talking about the journal articles that you've gone and collected. They're talking about the literature. This is your review of literature. This uh, prosecution of the evidence, this evidence is the data, the journal articles, 
the documentation that you go out and gather that you have to start with before you get to the part that Jenny started speaking of about actually implementing the plan. It is the process and we're still in planning right now. And uh, planning means I have to go out and find these articles and read them and see what they say about the problem. That's what you build your evidence on. And I need to ask somebody, do you see the bottom paragraph that says, in the end, I'm on page 188 of your book. Would you read the first two sentences in that paragraph, please? That's the point. You identify the problem, you describe the problem, you have to go out and find articles that help you understand the problem. And when you get those articles, then you are going to summarize them as they say here. And I'm gonna skip forward in our, uh, in our presentation here, because then you're going to put those articles on a chart or a table like you see on the screen. That's where you're gonna summarize those articles. That's what critiquing reviewing and summarizing the evidence. That means I'm going to read those 5, 10, 20 articles and put them in the chart. And when we talk about building an evidence-based table, this is the prosecution of the evidence. You haven't started doing any testing. You haven't started collecting any data because you're still trying to understand the scope of the problem. So when we talk about execute uh, prosecution of evidence it's about understanding what is known about the problem according to the literature questions so that's where we have that and that's why this is a process because often people want to identify a problem and then go and head into how we're going to solve it well that is a setup for unexpected problems and possible failure because you have not reviewed the literature on it. And Kyle read this question. You need to ask it early and ask it often. What does strong evidence direct the team to do in order to address the problem? That's something you need to be asking yourself often. And that means you've got to go back to this chart and figure out what is the evidence saying about it? And that's what people will be coming to you and asking you about. Not what Amandeep thinks about it, but what does the evidence say about it, Amandeep? And she should be able to tell me, uh, Jones and Martin said this, and here's the article. You can read it in this section and see what you think for yourself. Okay? So that is where we're going with, uh, the, uh, with the prosecution of the evidence yes you you've got the problem and you're right you're you're going to extrapolate from these articles that you've read or texts that you've read and see how it the problem panned out with authors in other settings or other populations or using separate tools and then you'll decide i'm going to try this approach with this problem. So two things I want to say. Uh, Kyle said, so we're doing evidence-based research. No, you're doing an evidence-based project, evidence-based practice project. You're not doing research because research helps to bring new knowledge. The PhD students do research and the DNP students are doing evidence-based projects. And uh, the other thing is, uh, Yes, you will want to uh, go ahead and determine how you, what is it? You'll say how you're going to approach the problem, but you don't know what the outcome is. You're letting the evidence tell you what the outcome is going to be rather than in a PICO, uh, hand washing will decrease C. diff levels by 5%. That's not a question you're going to have in a DMP project of uh, increased hand wash. How it could be, what impact does increasing hand washing uh, each time the nurse walks into the room has on 
see the outcome. So I, you're not the outcome. And you said something, you're not going to decide what the outcome is ahead of time. There's a term called a priori. Mm -hmm. That was in your book. So a priori is you're not stating what the outcome is prior to executing your uh, intervention. Okay. So that's where we are with that. So when we talk about uh, when we talk about prosecution of evidence, that's about how to handle your literature review. And then I'm going to ask you to just turn over to page 190. And I believe it's through 192. Uh, they talk about the purpose in your in your DNP project paper. You're going to have to write about the purpose of your project. And here is an example of how you can write about the purpose. There is an example here, and it starts with the purpose of this project. And no, they didn't say the purpose of this research. The purpose of this project. You'll have that. Another thing you have to do in your DNP paper is to write specific aims. That is gonna be a part of your background. Here's a section that describes to you what the uh, specific aims are. And then under that, they talk about the background. I'm pointing this out to you because in three or six months, you're gonna be scratching your head going, where did I get this from? How do I do this? I want you to make note now, you have access to how to do some of this through this textbook. Questions? So then, as we move forward a little bit here, we're going to say that the planning phase, that was the second phase that this chapter talked about, and that is just pointing out that you need to invest the time in planning to help save you time and money in the end. If you don't do the planning portion of a project, you're going to likely run into problems and take on unwarranted expenses, uh, problems with buy-in, problems with gaining resources when you don't plan. So we just want to emphasize the importance of planning for your project and following the process. And like they said, the uh, the DMP, the DMP does not have an established process, and that's why project management will help. Let's look at one last thing that's going to be very pertinent to your DMP project. And those, these are ways for you to help uh, forecast any problems that you're going to run into. The Gantt chart is something that you have to produce as a part of your paper. It's parts of the problem. Uh, it's actually tasks that you have to complete. And I'm showing you this Gantt chart to show you there are different types of Gantt charts. Now look at this Gantt chart. What do you think the difference might be or anything stands out between the two, the first and the second? You see how many different things that are going on in each phase? Yeah. Those, you want to have you want you want to have one task per time. That's too many things to keep up with, and and it gets very messy. The difference is you see how they have one task per time, more yes. granular. Another right. person can come and follow and see where you should be on this, whereas the other one, it would be very confusing to see where you are. Okay, so. Uh, it's time for us to stop, but I want you to look at uh, this uh, PowerPoint. They have the examples in there because you will have to produce a Gantt chart as a part of your project, which means at what time will you be doing which task to help keep you on uh, task because Suzanne already told us time is money, okay? And in your case, time is graduation day. So that's where Dr. Cleva Hall ended up the class in terms of the um, formal presentation and then the students engaged in some of the 
um, informal and project-based work that they were doing as a part of their synchronous Zoom class. One of the things that um, Dr. Clavel Hall didn't get to in the lesson uh, were several slides that looked at systems thinking a little bit deeper, although I think some of the other material that you'll find in Canvas will help with that. What I will do is in the link that is immediately below this particular recording that includes a PDF of all of the slides, I will include those six or seven slides that uh, Dr. Clavel Hall didn't get to as a part of her lecture because I think they are useful in terms of the notes that they provide. Her final slide that she had in the presentation, which I did want to speak to a little bit, uh, was this summary slide that we have here. And one of the main things that you want to um, get out of this is the fact that this project planning and this focus that we've had so far on this idea of models and frameworks and um, processes and, and those sort of larger items. Um, in this case, it was a lot of time on project planning. That's all part of this idea of systems thinking, being able to think about your translational research project or your evidence-based practice project in terms of a larger system. And by larger, I don't necessarily mean larger in size. So um, it just means in terms of a uh, conceptually larger. So not just looking at it in terms of I'm going to do this, but I'm going to plan out this project in this sequence of steps that I'm going to undertake to collect this data to determine whether or not this particular evidence-based practice is effective in this context. And as Dr. Clavel Hall mentioned in the presentation, I believe, um, you know, the system that you could be looking at could be as, as small as at the bedside, a microsystem, if you will, or as large as the entire hospital and, and the entire organization or a macro system. So the size of the system isn't what we're thinking about when we talk about this larger thing thinking, uh, thinking about it from a larger perspective. Uh, it's really the how we are approaching the overall initiative that we're looking at. So this idea of, of systems thinking really is what wants to ground us in what it is that we are doing going forward. And you'll note that near the second half, or really the last third, I guess, of part of what Dr. Clavel Hall presented on, there was a fair amount looking at this idea of the literature review activity that you are currently starting right now by searching through the literature and, and actually going through and annotating those things uh, based upon the information that is useful based or in terms of being able to inform your particular problem of practice that you would like to tackle. So that's really where I want to finish up this week. You'll notice here in Canvas now, again, there's the additional six or seven slides that uh, from this lecture that Dr. Clavel Hall didn't get to, but I want it to include for the purposes of your own notes. And then there's a slew of additional resources there in Canvas that are focused upon this larger idea of systems thinking that fall after this particular presentation that are optional in nature, although they are ones that I think you would find useful because they do get into this issue of systems thinking quite well.